this drama treads a very fine line between fact and fiction. We've obviously researched these artists, we know their world, we know where they where they were brought up, the kind of areas they lived in, the kind of places they worked in. Uh, but of course it's a drama so we really want to get engaged with the characters. So the writer's done a really brilliant job of marrying some of those facts and anecdotes and little details of authenticity about these people but also with a really engaging, sexy, fun relationship drama. I think the, the, the reason we've made the piece is, is to um, uh, is about their relationships. I mean, obviously we know about their paintings, we know about the history of them, and in researching the roles, a lot of the, the, the reading on it is very academic. Um, but Franny Moore, who's written the book, which this is based on, um, has written a human story about their lives, their love lives, the, their incestuous relationships, um, their um, <coughs> jealousy of each other, their br brotherhood, um, their pre-Raphaelite ship, and the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. It's about young people making their way in the world and uh, it's about youthful aspiration and ambition and revolutionary fervour and what happens to that uh, in three different characters' lives. Just, just slightly. There is, of course, a very raunchy angle to this drama. This is a group of young artists and their models and muses, and they have very passionate relationships. Although we are dealing with um, a period project, it's, it's, it's quite relevant, I think, to, um, to the times we're living in now. You know, you're following these four boys who um, are sort of celebrities of, of their age, and, um, and they, they, they sort of engage in just as many scandals and, and hijinks and, um, as, as lots of the celebrities that we read about in papers do today. And um, I think they've, they've sexed it up a bit. I think it's quite a racy piece, um, but at the same time, it's got some brilliant characters and, um, and a really brilliant storyline. The really iconic pre-Raphaelite paintings of their day were incredible, allegories and moral and religious paintings uh, and they felt very very different from the art that had gone before them they weren't necessarily overladen with sex or sexual content but behind the subtext of the paintings we see a different story and it's the story between the artists and the models themselves <laughs> Franny Moore has worked in broadcasting and the arts for many years now and she began researching the book Desperate Romantics some three or four years ago and, and it's inc an incredible book, one has to read it just to see the, the, the very diverse lives that these, this bunch of artists lived uh, and we, she brought the book to us some years ago and we began developing the scripts with Pete Bowker. The whole thing started because um, a writer called Franny Moore was writing a book called Desperate Romantics, which was about the very, very tangled emotional lives of this bunch of artists and how that impacted on their work. And I didn't, I, I resisted it at first because I didn't want to write um, a docudrama about artists. For me, the epitome of a docudrama about artists is Monet standing in a field saying, I'm going to paint the light. I'm going to call this Impressionism. And it's a terrible art history moment. And so I didn't, want to go down that route and thankfully neither did Franny and she if you like she gave me permission to kind of run with this and fictionalize those lives which are pretty extraordinary anyway but clearly there are moments when I take great liberties with the facts and then there are moments when I use the facts and actually some of the facts are more remarkable than stuff I, I've made up. When I first came to the script what I wanted to do was capture something of the Victorian era but maybe part of it that we don't normally see on television costume drama. That's to say these artists were actually hanging around with low life and hanging around amongst kind of semi-criminal circles, mainly because of their poverty. That, that was the life they were living. And also their idealism, which again was a very familiar young man's skewed idealism of on the one hand these passionate beliefs in social justice and on the other hand wanting to get laid. And those two things will always pull young men in two different directions. 
partly they want to be part of the establishment because they desperately want to be known and have recognition for their work, but another part of them wants to throw a two-fingered salute up at the establishment, so they're quite often seen behaving really, really badly in the academy. The Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood was a group of young artists who got together with a specific manifesto and they didn't like what was going on in the kind of high Victorian art and thought it would be better to go back to the simple artistic principles from before, before Raphael. Not dissimilar to some of our contemporary artists, Tracy Emin, Damien Hurst, the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood in their day realised that by coming together as a group they could be larger than the sum of their parts. So they were really starting something of a revolutionary movement, if you like. I think a good parallel to be drawn with these characters is, is punks, a hundred years later, um, uh, and with the punk movement. The punk movement was um, a sort of retaliation to prog rock and they wanted to strip all the sort of fancy music of prog rock down to back down to three instruments, four chords, um, and go back to it being simple and raw. And in a way, that's what the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood wanted to do in going back to art before Raphael, so medieval art, but using the, the, the accuracy and the perfection of the Renaissance. The young artists of England should go to nature in all singleness of heart and walk with her laboriously and trustingly, having no other thought but how best to penetrate her meaning, rejecting nothing, selecting nothing, and scorning nothing. Your words, sir. I'm aware they're my words. You could be describing these daring young men, sir. You could be describing these very artists. Well, they need Ruskin, so they're desperate to have his good opinion, but they also uh, laugh at him and mock him behind his back. These artists are um, more than anything ambitious. And I think if you're ambitious you, in art, in any, in any sort of section of art, what you really want is for other people to see what you do. Do you know what I mean? That you, wanna, you, you don't just want to paint and keep it to yourself. You want people to see it. And he was the key to that. The Royal Academy was the epicentral point for artistic creation and the artistic establishment in Britain. I think the Royal Academy had a different attitude to each of the painters. I think they felt that Millet was uh, a genius who had strayed from the fold and come under the influence of this rather wild group. And indeed, they got Millet back into the fold fairly quickly. Uh, I think Holman Hunt they felt was verging on the blasphemous in, in, the, way, in the way he portrayed religious themes and the, in the themes, themes and the way he painted Christ and so on. And I think they really didn't take Rossetti seriously. I'm finding it hard to draw under such damned pressure. I think to expose that kind of sexuality in paintings was incredibly risky back then. I mean, but, and they showed. But it may, well, it may have hindered their reputation at first, but people wanted their work. I mean, they were always, they were always private buyers. It was very high taboo or something, weren't they? I mean, people kind of wanted what they knew they shouldn't have or something. Yeah. You know? Still the same. Yeah, still the same. I am proud to be a member of the Brotherhood. Without them, there would be no Ophelia. No, Ophelia is just the beginning. Myself and Mr. Hunt and Mr. Rossetti here are about to change the world. I'm Rave Sport. I'm playing William Holman Hunt, otherwise known as Maniac, or Mad. Um, he is a painter. I'm Samuel Barnett, playing John Millet, um, pre-Raphaelite painter, youngest person ever to be accepted to the Royal Academy at the age of 11. Um, he was a child genius, and he eventually became uh, the president of the Royal Academy later in life, but we don't get to see that in this series. I'm Aidan Turner, <laughs> and I'm playing Dante Gabriel Rossetti. The most famous one. Yeah. The one everyone's heard of. The, the one everyone knows. The sexy one. Yeah, the sexy, better looking one then. Mm. than Yeah. The, yeah. Um, my name's Sam Crane. I'm playing Fred, Fred Walters. Uh, and I'm a sort of composite character, mainly based on Fred Stevens, who was one of the original members of the PRB, uh, with a bit of Walter Deverell, a little bit of William Michael Rossetti, and maybe even a touch of Ford Mannix Brown in there. And perhaps a bit of Christina Rossetti as well. Mm. Yeah, maybe a touch of that. But basically, I, I'm, uh, I'm the, become the kind of the group's diarist and a sort of journalist. I write about them. I like, I like to see him as the Jack Kerouac. I've said this to you before. Yeah, yeah. Jack Kerouac to, Bill to, to, to Neil Cassidy, uh, Allen Ginsberg, and William Burroughs. That's brilliant. Yeah. 
seen through, through his eyes. Yeah, we've thought about it. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of all through my eyes. I came up with that on my own. Ah, you maniac, you could have warned us. Do it, Miss Tiddle. Please avert your gaze. Ah. Unlike Gabriel, we're not all slaves to our last, Fred. I loved your painting of the Eve of St. Agnes. Well, you've acquainted yourself with my work. It's good start. With Holman Hunt, the, you know, the fact that he became this kind of cornerstone of the establishment and the academy, that just the sheer creative energy is astonishing. Rossetti is very... <coughs> um, uncomplicated in his attitude to sex and his attitude to laudanum, for example, whereas Hunt is always going to see a problem, even when it's very straightforward. Marry the girl you love and you'll be allowed to have sex with her for the rest of your life. Even that to Hunt causes some kind of conscience or ethical or searching religious problem. John Millet was a odd fish. There's no two ways about it. Samuel Barnett captures this bird-like quality of Millet who was seemingly oblivious to the world around him and was so obsessive about his painting. In those three it's always good to have the boy who's led astray and in, in some respects Hunt and Rossetti are alternative father figures to Millet who is kind of caught between these two examples, both of which aren't great examples of how to be a grown-up man but Millet doesn't know that. I didn't know you could write that well. Have you read none of my other work? I make it a point to never read about myself, Fred. I don't care what the world thinks of Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Right, well, I see. Uh, I feared it might be because I'm not taken seriously by the Brotherhood. No, no. You are the most vital brother of all. There's a character in the series called Fred Walters who is entirely my invention. And the reason I put him in there was he's us, if you like. He's outside, he's outside this group. Um, Obviously, at school, at college, in work, there are always fashionable people, but for most of us, we're on the outside of that. And if you're going to relate to these guys, I think it's got to be through this, this figure of Fred, who's a kind of wannabe journalist, but a hanger-on. Fred takes us on a really incredible journey with the characters. We see the world through his eyes. We see his excitement and sheer sense of awe at the way that these young men comport themselves in polite Victorian society. There were many advantages to hanging out with the glamour boys, but perhaps the greatest advantage of all was that sometimes a girl wasn't impressed by all that wit and bluster, and might even find herself wanting the quiet one in the corner, the steady type. And I was as steady as they came. But of course she's not interested in me. <laughs> Only as a friend, I mean, come on. <laughs> What's that about? He's oh, fed up with that. Everyone, oh, all the right. women in this actually, you know, all, all that Fred wants to be, he wants to be this kind of glamorous, kind of, you know, shagging around kind of guy, but n none of the women... You give Annie that. one. You do give Annie one? Oh, yeah, we can say that. Yeah, I do. You nearly died modelling for this painting. Was it a sacrifice worth making? My passion is art. And the artist is as great as John Everett Millet. It doesn't become a model to interrupt. They were famous. They became famous, yeah. these boys. And the models that they used were the Kate Moss and the Naomi Campbell of the day. Um, do you know what I mean? And they were written about in the papers. They were, they were, there's a scene yeah. when uh, we go to the Royal Academy and there's paparazzi sketching instead of taking well, they photographs. Um, they became socialised, didn't they? Was, yeah, they were completely... Fa they were, I mean, they were, they were scandalous. They wanted to make art. You know, it's not an interesting job. You stand around all day in the same pose, possibly in the freezing cold or in the snow and all kinds of weather. So, I mean... For, I, for a year? Well, for, yeah, for a year. It's incredible. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing what they did. A lot of respect for that. All our female characters are equally important in this piece because they play not just the object but the subject of the guy's attentions. They are models, muses, they're taking incredibly dangerous steps into this world of bohemian artists. Lizzie Siddle, however, takes an enormous risk being an artist model. She's a hat shop girl, it's a working class profession, but it's at least it's uh, socially um, acceptable. However, however, being a model is one step up from prostitution, so she's taking incredible risk working with these artists. Uh, she began in a hat shop, she was founded in a hat shop by uh, Fred Walters, and um, she became the pre-Raphaelite's muse. Excuse me. Excuse me. This is going to sound strange. I'm getting worried he does. These gentlemen here are the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. Really? The Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood? So you have heard of them? No. No. 
They're here looking for models, just like you. What it did for Lizzie is, although it, she risks social disgrace, Lizzie Siddle clearly had more to her than her life was offering at the time. She, was, she loved the world, she, was, she wanted to be a painter herself, and that was opened up to her as a result of modelling for Rossetti. When they're, they're high together, they're very high, and then when they're low, extremely low. Um, I think near the end of their life, she starts to become a lot like him, quite manipulative and controlling. Um, and obviously she disagrees with, uh, with all his infidelities and um, the way he uh, cheats on her, you know, with every girl around the corner. And she was the one kind of true love, I guess, in his life. I mean, he did a lot of messing around, but I guess she was his, uh, she was his muse, but I guess in some way she was his soulmate too, you know? I mean, he really loved her. He never got over her death. Well, he didn't, yeah, he never no. got over her. I mean, he even digged up her grave and took poems out and stuff, but, I, you know, I think he still loved her until, yeah. until the day she died. I think Lizzie perhaps found herself in a situation which she couldn't control and found herself under the spell of this very charismatic, handsome man and, and was in love and, and was, was then introduced to, to life in a way that she'd never seen before. I'm out shopping with my mum and uh, I hat shopping and I spy this, you know, a vision of red-haired beauty. Or pre raphaelite uh, beauty. Yeah, that I just know, and I've, I've been kind of hanging around on the fringes of these guys, listening to what they're saying and, you know, kind of hero worship them. And I know that this is what they're looking for. They're, they're kind of, this is what they're lacking, this um, beautiful, unusual model. And I see her and that's, so I introduce them to Lizzie Siddle. And at, at the same time, I'm falling head over heels in love with her. How can you paint temptation without knowing what's on the other side? I know what it is to be tempted. That is good enough. But you don't know what it's like to give in. Hunt was locked into some kind of sexual paralysis, whereas on the one hand, he obviously was deeply attracted to grubby Annie as she was. That's what excited him. The comedy and the drama in, in my character's journey comes from his relationship with Annie Miller from the fact that William Holman Hunt was um, a staunch Calvinist and um, in a time of such propriety, when, when, when even table legs were covered up because they looked sexual, um, and this man falls in love with a prostitute. Um, when he comes back and offers me marriage, I mean, you can see it's, it's the best thing in the world, that's all I want. It's not just for my own security, but I love him. Then he drops me, and that is a very painful drop and I do lose my, my mind slightly. You really don't know why you're here, do you? I'm here to paint you. Am I not? In the course of this drama, what I've done is used Millet's kind of indecision and his understandable nervousness, because what's... What is he being set up here? What's going on? You know, I mean, if you're in the heart of this, you can. But he was clearly not experienced around women. He was clearly not experienced. Full stop. No real naked ladies. A half naked wife who is so frustrated because I am not doing it to her that she forces herself upon me, but it doesn't last very long. And uh, we um, button up pretty bloody quickly. And. Uh, and move on. I'm not really interested. Ruskin is not really interested in sex. Uh, I am. Um, uh, I am acting that. Ruskin's emotional state through these six hours is the thing that caused me the most kind of problem because I couldn't decide what I thought about him. And <clears throat> one of the keys to his emotional state actually came when we cast Tom Hollander. Ruskin's first close relationship with any of them is with Millet, who was technically the most brilliant when he was youngest, and uh, Ruskin edges his wife, Effie, towards Millet, um, because it's so unhappy at home. Tom came up with two brilliant suggestions. One was, he said, could there be a moment in the series where we hear Ruskin do what he does best, where we hear some of his description of art without it being an art history moment. And I do, I include that and something happens to your regard for Ruskin, because all we've seen him, if we don't know nothing about him, what we've seen is a faintly ridiculous man. But when he talks about uh, Millet's painting of nature, he, can, he, he nails it. 
and, and in beautiful language. I, I mean, I lifted the dialogue completely from a, a letter he'd written. The other thing Tom said, which was more of a challenge, was could you give him a moment where he justifies his attitude to sex? There's a suggestion in this that he's having inappropriate relationships with young women, which um, is no, not proven or substantiated. And it's a sort of gossipy rumour about him, which um, I was quite keen to uh, um, not play uh, and rather just play a man who, um, uh, who isn't really that into sex uh, and finds it a bit frightening and prefers to, uh, prefers to live in a world full of ideas and uh, abstract things and things that are beautiful. Effie manages to get out of her marriage with Ruskin because they never consummate it. He cannot and will not have sex with her and she falls in love with my character and uh, she gets the wedding annulled and the marriage annulled and then she marries my character and they kind of live happily ever after. They have about 13 children. I think that the three women in the series probably would have got on if they were talking about the inadequacies of the three men they were involved with. They, they ended up kind of tearing themselves and each other's lives apart because of all their relationships with with all the women that they fell in love with and the models that they that they dated. For some of them it's a leg up, Annie Miller, street prostitute from the age of 13, and she gets a big break as an artist model with Hunt. Fun, bubbly, a great zest for life, strong, daring, almost impulsive with some of her decision making, but, you know, 19th century prostitute, the word is surviving and that's what she's doing. Now, I personally think that Effie is an amazing woman in her, in, in her own right. I mean, she eventually um, gets an annulment on her marriage to, to John Ruskin at a time when that was absolutely unheard of. I think what's fascinating about Ruskin is here it's the compartmentalisation of his life. Here is a man who is clearly brilliant when he's writing about art and the function of art in society and writing about society. And here is a man who is completely backward when he comes to think about relationships, about love, about sex. We have been married for five years. And in that time you have kissed my shoulder four times, cupped my breast in your hand twice and once, nuzzled my neck and whimpered like a dog. I thought you understood that this marriage was based on mutual love, mutual respect and companionship. I need more. No woman needs more. You go quite against nature when you demand it. Please, tell me what I can do to help you overcome your fear. Art critic, social reformer, geologist, architecture expert, artist, teacher, inventor of free education for all. Uh, I think he even founded the National Trust, but not in this. In this, he's um, a bit of a paedophile um, and, uh, and an art critic. And John Ruskin was the art critic of the day. If you had him on your side, then you're pretty much guaranteed a successful career. Our boys like to hang out. Let's face it, they do cruise for a bit of fun on the streets of London, and they like slumming it. Some of them are posh boys, but they do like those good-time gals, and that's a bit about what this drama's about. So we need to see these colourful young peacocks up in quite grimy, uh, difficult, dirty in, uh, London. So we get a bit of a sense of that. And that's, this is where we are today. We're at Luton Who Farm, uh, which is just outside London. And as you can see behind me, we've got, um, we've got this incredible cobbled street, which is doubling for slum London, basically. And uh, we're also filming the Chop House, which is where the, the boys congregate. They talk about their, their art, they talk about women, and they talk about their, their rivalries with one another. And that's all happening behind us now. The sets and locations have been have been brilliant really I mean obviously dealing with sort of I my character has mostly been in um, Ruskin's house which um, we filmed in Luton Hoo and in this sort of big old house that I suppose is, is a bit of an empty shell at the moment but we went in there and transformed it and, and it looked very opulent and grand um, and and then like you say today we we're in Pinewood but they've transformed that into Shaggers Wood I think is what <laughs> what it's referred to as um, and and so yes I mean they're so clever all of the all of the sets have been fantastic 
we see the world of the art establishment in the Royal Academy where the academicians were, uh, were showing their, uh, their kind of innovations in art and where our young aspirational artists desperately want to have their work displayed. So we had to create something of the Royal Academy, an incredible challenge, and we worked at Pinewood Studios and built some of that interior there. These artists paid tremendous attention to detail and they had a very vivid colour palette and that's certainly been something we wanted to reflect in the production and design of this series. So the colour palette, the design palette, the makeup and costume palette has been designed with that in mind and we're being very referential in terms of uh, some of the inspiration we've got behind their looks. But also with the photography and the way we've shot this drama has a very crisp, uh, realistic feel. So we're right in the middle of a Victorian world, uh, yet we, we almost feel it's got documentary realism. Each of our characters, very different characters, and so they have a different uniform to reflect that. Hunt, a very religious character, very uptight, so we've really given him a bit more of a dark colour palette, a bit more of an uptight colour palette. Uh, Rossetti, much more loose, laid back, generally got his shirt open. He's, he's basically one step between the bedroom or the bar. John Millet, he's an absolute peacock of a character. Prim, little Lord Fauntleroy. I think if you had to have a look at this costume and say which was the best, you'd probably say mine. I think you'd probably say mine if you saw my Willy Wonka. I'd say purple both coat. of these guys. Well, I'd say... No, you all, Unfortunately, great. I haven't got my really nice shoes on that were made especially for me, but uh -huh. they're, they're pretty special. They're all flamboyant, they're all crazy, you know, it's these crazy kids and how to kind of um, um, remove them all from almost the, the rest of society. You know, and how to make them different, and almost that, that they didn't they didn't care. You know, they didn't give a fuck. So the the script um, Pete Barker's has written, the, his first description of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood is um, they're in a McLaren-esque combination of workwear and highwear, um, and he describes um, Rossetti looking with Nell-esque, as well as their, in, in the same way that their art stood out, the way they looked stood out. I think mm. they were art in themselves. Fred, like, he, I, I'm, you know, would make a bit of an effort. Um, but can't maybe quite carry it off with the same panache as these other guys. Oh, though. you can, mate. Don't worry about oh, it. You thanks. Can. Thanks for saying that. You're good. It's kind of you. Can, yeah. <laughs> I've had lots of high necks and covered up and very respectable costumes. Um, this outfit actually is, is, is kind of early stages of pregnancy for Effie Ruskin because she does end up having, I think, about 13 children with John Millet. Um, and so in later scenes, you'll see me with a big bump. But, um, but the costumes are gorgeous. The, the job that the costume department and the makeup department have done is amazing with the girls. If you look in the, in the tavern scenes, and when you first see Annie Miller in the tavern, mm -hmm. um, the Victorian prostitute makeup that Karen Hartley Thomas has done is all white and um, uh, with red lips and it's red hair piled on top of the head and the sort of corsets and it looks very Vivian Westwood esque. It's a very striking image. And there's also a scene at the beginning of episode one um, where we're choosing a prostitute to. to um, to paint and they're modelling naked for us. It's sort of like an X Factor type Rosetti, like Simon Cowell. The corsets, if, if you get one that's very well fitting, then they're, they're not too uncomfortable. It's only when you start to, and if you sit in them properly and you stand in them properly, as you were supposed to, um, they're fine. It's when we start to put our 21st century slouching in and, uh, and then they find sort of little creases and, and they become a little bit uncomfortable or the bones stick in or you've had a bit too much lunch or, you know, that's when it starts to get a bit painful. But, you know, they're not too bad. <laughs> really good. I've been quite lucky in not having to wear corsets. And throughout, it. yeah, Lizzie was was renowned for never wearing a corset. So, I mean, initially in the first three episodes, James, um, the, the costume designer, he wanted to give me a bit of a figure, of, uh, in order for my character to progress. You know, to see her the states that she she eventually falls into. So I've been lucky not having to wear corsets. I hate corsets because um, I can't eat my lunch when I'm wearing my corset, so I have to have it taken off. And once I got my tights stuck under my corset, so I had to cut them off when I needed the loo. And um, yeah, I just don't like them really, and they feel like they cut me in half and break my ribs. Annie, Annie, I was describing the woman in the painting. I wasn't describing you. Why not? Is she different? Am I cleverer than her? Am I more of a whore or am I less of a whore? I was describing the relationship that the woman has subjected herself to. You were thinking your own filthy thoughts, then making sure the woman got her share by telling the world what a slut she was! The thing that we normally, we sometimes don't get from period dramas is, that, is how much tougher life was, not just for the very poor, and indeed it was horribly tough, but for people like 
the Brotherhood, the aspiring artists. And the there are times when they're clearly choosing between food and paint. There was an explosion in the in the sort of publishing industry as well in the printing press. So that for the first time, um, paintings that that this group of guys had, had done themselves could be um, what's the word reprinted, Repro yeah. Yeah, nationally yeah. reproduced in in newspapers and in in periodicals, so that everybody knew about them suddenly. Yeah. It's like you know being published in Heat magazine. You know, mm -hmm. so it's that was the, and that was the first time that that had really happened. So they became celebrities, and so did their models. Yeah, the journey from rags to riches was literally a journey from rags to riches. These guys would have been in rags, and uh, and um, you know, so that that's quite an, an ambition, and to see that ambition fulfilled for at least two of the three, that it makes them exceptional for the time. I've lost Ruskin, of course. He refuses to speak with me. The more do you want from the man who's already made your career? You are an associate of the Academy on his recommendation. At least the order of release has been sold. What? When did you hear this? This afternoon. 500 guineas. So I suppose that's something. It's a story of three men's lives told with a real energy they were trying to change the world with their art, but they were constantly distracted by lust. And I think that's what people should bring to the programme when they sit down to watch it and hopefully take away from it at the end. After the six hours, I would like the audience to feel that they've been entertained, that these men had their faults, but feel affectionate about the way those faults have been explored. And I'd also like them to think that it was, you know, it had more laughs than the average art biography. Ask for art's sake. Hi. Back to work. Thank you. Back Thank to work. You. Thank you very much. Or, as the boys might have it, art for arse's sake.